It was a typical sunny afternoon in a quiet suburban neighborhood. The sun shone brightly, casting warm light over the well-maintained lawns and tree-lined streets. In the local park, children played freely, their laughter echoing through the air. It was the kind of day where nothing out of the ordinary was expected. Parents chatted on benches while keeping a watchful eye on their kids, enjoying the peaceful environment. Among the children was 12-year-old Malik, a bright and kind-hearted black boy who lived nearby with his family. Malik loved spending time outdoors, especially at the park, where he often played basketball with his friends or explored the nearby trails on his bike. Today, he was sitting on the swings, lost in thought as he watched the other kids play. His mother had dropped him off for some fresh air before heading to a meeting, confident that the park was a safe space. What no one could have predicted was how quickly this peaceful scene would turn into something far more sinister. Malik had no idea that he was about to become the target of someone's misguided assumptions and that a routine day at the park would turn into a nightmare he couldn't have imagined. As Malik swung gently, humming a tune to himself, a police car slowly rolled down the street that bordered the park. The officer inside, Officer Donovan, had been patrolling the neighborhood for years. On the surface, it was just another quiet day in a quiet neighborhood. But in Officer Donovan's mind, things were rarely as peaceful as they seemed. Scanning the park, his eyes landed on Malik, and something about the boy's presence, completely innocent, triggered Donovan's suspicion. Malik, unaware of the approaching officer, continued swinging back and forth, lost in his own world. He was wearing a red hoodie, a pair of jeans, and his favorite sneakers. With headphones in his ears, he listened to music, the world around him fading into the background. His father had always told him to stay out of trouble, and Malik had taken that advice to heart. He was a good kid, respectful, smart, and with a bright future ahead of him. As he swung higher, Malik glanced around the park. A few of his friends were playing basketball on the nearby court, but he wasn't in the mood for a game today. He was content just relaxing, enjoying the fresh air. His mother had promised to pick him up in an hour, and until then, he planned to make the most of his time alone. The park, with its towering trees and open fields, was his escape from the pressures of school and the worries of the world. What Malik didn't realize was that someone else had noticed him, and not in the way he might have expected. Officer Donovan, still watching from his patrol car, began to feel a growing sense of unease. In his mind, Malik didn't belong. The boy's relaxed posture, the way he sat alone on the swings, it all seemed suspicious to the officer, even though there was nothing remotely out of the ordinary. Donovan parked his car and stepped out, his hand resting on his utility belt as he approached the park. His eyes were locked on Malik, and in his mind, he was already forming conclusions about the boy. Despite the peaceful setting, Donovan felt something was off. He had received a report earlier in the day about a young black male causing trouble in a nearby neighborhood, and now Malik seemed to fit the vague description. Without giving it a second thought, Officer Donovan decided it was time to intervene. Officer Donovan was a man in his mid-forties, hardened by years on the force. He had patrolled this suburban neighborhood for over a decade, and in that time, he had developed a mindset that left little room for nuance. To him, the world was divided into two types of people, those who belonged and those who didn't. And in this predominantly white, upper-middle-class neighborhood, Malik fell into the latter category in Donovan's eyes. As Donovan made his way toward the swings, his eyes never left Malik. The boy seemed oblivious to the approaching officer, still listening to music and swaying gently. Donovan's steps were firm, his posture tense. He was already preparing for a confrontation that hadn't yet materialized, driven by assumptions he had made based solely on Malik's appearance. To Donovan, this was just part of the job, being vigilant, keeping an eye on anyone who might seem out of place, but his approach was anything but neutral. His thoughts were clouded by years of ingrained bias, and as he got closer, his mind raced with imagined scenarios. What if this boy was the troublemaker from earlier? What if he was here to cause problems? Donovan's instincts told him to be cautious, though there was nothing in Malik's behavior to suggest he was a threat. The officer's hand hovered near his holster as he called out to Malik. Hey, kid, Donovan said, his voice sharp and authoritative. What are you doing here? Nothing. Malik startled, pulled out his headphones and looked up, confused. He hadn't noticed the officer approaching, 
and now he felt a wave of uncertainty wash over him. I'm just... sitting, Malik responded, his voice quiet, unsure of why he was being questioned. But Officer Donovan wasn't satisfied with the answer. To Officer Donovan, Malik's presence alone was enough to raise red flags. The officer's mind raced through stereotypes, assumptions that had nothing to do with reality, but everything to do with his own biases. Malik's red hoodie, the fact that he was sitting alone, and his calm demeanor, all of it seemed suspicious to Donovan. The officer had convinced himself that this boy must be up to something, and he was determined to find out what. Malik, on the other hand, was completely innocent. He had no idea why this officer was questioning him, and the intensity of Donovan's gaze made him feel uneasy. He had been taught by his parents to respect authority, but right now he was starting to feel afraid. The way Donovan was looking at him made it clear that he was seen as a suspect, even though he hadn't done anything wrong. Do you live around here? Donovan demanded, taking a step closer. His tone was hard and it didn't leave room for any friendly conversation. Malik nodded, his heart beginning to race. Yes, sir. My mom lives a few blocks away. I'm just waiting for her to pick me up, he explained, hoping that his answer would satisfy the officer and that this strange encounter would end soon. But Donovan wasn't satisfied. His mind was already made up, and Malik's innocent responses only seemed to deepen his suspicions. You sure about that? The officer pressed, his eyes narrowing. Because I got a report about someone causing trouble around here earlier, and you fit the description. Malik's eyes widened. No, sir, I haven't done anything. I've just been sitting here, he said, his voice shaky now. But Donovan wasn't listening. He was convinced that Malik was hiding something, and he was about to take things to a whole new level. Officer Donovan's eyes hardened as he stepped closer to Malik, his hand now resting firmly on his belt. There was no clear reason for the officer's aggressive stance, but he had already made up his mind about the boy. Despite Malik's calm and respectful demeanor, Donovan was convinced that something wasn't right. To him, Malik was no longer just a kid at the park. He was a potential criminal. I'm going to need to see some ID, Donovan said, his voice cold and demanding. Next, Malik, still sitting on the swing, looked up at the officer in disbelief. ID? I'm 12, he replied, his voice barely above a whisper. He didn't carry ID. There was no reason for a boy his age to have it. His mind raced as he tried to make sense of what was happening. Why was this officer treating him like he had done something wrong? But Donovan wasn't having it. His face twisted in frustration, and he grabbed Malik's arm, pulling him roughly off the swing. Stand up, Donovan ordered. You're coming with me. We'll sort this out at the station. Malik's heart pounded in his chest as fear washed over him. Wait, what? I didn't do anything, he protested, trying to pull his arm free. But Donovan's grip tightened, and he quickly reached for his handcuffs. The officer's aggressive behavior was completely out of line, and yet he seemed determined to treat Malik like a criminal. As Donovan cuffed Malik's hands behind his back, the boy felt panic rising in his throat. He had never been in a situation like this before, and he didn't understand why it was happening. Please, sir, I didn't do anything wrong, Malik pleaded, his voice trembling. But Donovan wasn't listening. In his mind, the arrest was justified even though Malik had done nothing to deserve it. Malik's heart raced as Officer Donovan roughly pulled him away from the swings. The boy's eyes filled with tears, his mind spinning with fear and confusion. He couldn't understand why this was happening, why a day at the park had suddenly turned into a nightmare. The handcuffs were tight around his wrists, and every movement made the cold metal bite into his skin. Malik had been raised to trust the police, to believe they were there to protect him. But now, standing in the middle of the park with his hands behind his back, that trust was shattered. Please, sir, I didn't do anything, Malik begged, his voice trembling as he tried to comprehend what he had done to deserve this treatment. His legs felt weak as Donovan led him toward the patrol car, and every step felt heavier than the last. The officer's grip on his arm was tight, his face set in stone, and he didn't seem to hear or care about Malik's pleas. People in the park began to notice the scene unfolding. A few parents looked over, concerned, wondering what the boy could have possibly done. But most were too afraid to intervene, not wanting to get involved with the police. Still, whispers spread through the crowd, and a few brave onlookers pulled out their phones to record what was happening. 
They couldn't believe that such a young boy was being treated like a criminal. For Malik, the world seemed to slow down around him. He glanced toward the entrance of the park, hoping to see his mother's car pulling up, praying that this nightmare would end. But there was no sign of her yet. In the meantime, Officer Donovan pushed him into the back of the patrol car, slamming the door shut behind him. The sound echoed in Malik's ears, making him feel even more trapped. Inside the car, Malik's hands shook uncontrollably. He couldn't stop thinking about what would happen next. Was he going to jail? What would his mom say? His chest tightened with panic, and all he could do was sit there, helpless and afraid, as Donovan walked back around to the front of the car. Officer Donovan, now back in the driver's seat of the patrol car, took a moment to collect himself. His heart was still racing from the adrenaline of the situation. In his mind, he had acted correctly. He had stopped what he believed to be a potential threat, a boy who fit the description. But beneath the surface, his actions were driven by something far more dangerous, his own prejudices and assumptions. To him, Malik wasn't just a kid. He was a suspect, someone who had to be controlled and subdued. As he started the car, Donovan glanced in the rearview mirror, catching a glimpse of Malik's frightened face. The boy's wide eyes reflected pure terror, but Donovan pushed that thought away. He was focused on getting back to the station, where he planned to process the arrest and figure out what this kid was up to. In Donovan's mind, Malik's silence and fear were signs of guilt, and he felt justified in his actions. The patrol car pulled away from the park, leaving behind a crowd of confused and concerned onlookers. A few parents huddled together, discussing what they had just seen. One of them, a man named Kevin, couldn't shake the feeling that something was deeply wrong about the situation. Kevin had watched the entire encounter unfold and had recorded it on his phone. Now he was determined to get to the bottom of what had just happened. He knew the boy had done nothing wrong. He had been there the whole time. As Donovan drove toward the station, Malik sat frozen in the back seat, his mind racing with questions. Why was this happening? Why wouldn't the officer listen to him? His hands were still cuffed behind his back, and the cold metal made it impossible for him to find any comfort. The fear that had started when Donovan first approached him was now fully consuming him. He felt alone, powerless, and terrified of what was to come. The drive to the station felt like an eternity for Malik, though in reality, only minutes had passed. But those minutes were enough for everything to change. As the patrol car sped through the quiet streets, Officer Donovan's mind replayed the events of the arrest. He kept justifying his actions to himself, clinging to the excuse he had used on Malik. You fit the description. Those words echoed in his head, reinforcing the narrative he had built. That Malik was somehow guilty by association, even though the reality was that there was no reason to suspect him at all. In Donovan's world, those few words were enough to excuse his actions. Malik, on the other hand, sat in the back seat, those same words haunting him. You fit the description? What did that even mean? Malik had no idea what Donovan was talking about. As far as he knew, he hadn't done anything wrong. His only crime seemed to be sitting on the swings alone, wearing a red hoodie. And now, because of that, he was sitting in the back of a police car with handcuffs around his wrists. Malik's mind raced. He thought about the lessons his parents had taught him, how to stay out of trouble, how to avoid suspicious situations, and how to always be polite and respectful especially when dealing with the police. But no matter how hard he tried to stay calm, his fear kept growing. The thought of being taken to a police station, of being treated like a criminal, was too much to bear. As Donovan drove, his radio crackled with an update about the earlier report. A dispatcher's voice came through, stating that the real suspect in the area had been apprehended elsewhere, confirming that the individual was an older male, not a child. But Donovan, too caught up in his own tunnel vision, barely registered the update. He had already made his decision about Malik, and nothing was going to change that. For Malik, those ten minutes felt like an eternity. But little did Donovan know, karma was about to catch up to him faster than he could have ever imagined. Ten minutes after pulling Malik out of the park, Officer Donovan arrived at the station, still convinced that he had done the right thing. He parked the patrol car and got out opening the back door to pull Malik out. The boy's face was pale, his eyes wide with fear, and he hesitated as Donovan yanked him roughly by the arm. 
Come on, Donovan snapped. Let's go inside. But as they walked toward the station, something unexpected happened. The door to the station burst open, and a tall, imposing figure stepped out. Donovan froze in his tracks. Standing in front of him was none other than his commanding officer, Captain Henderson, a respected and powerful figure within the department, and he was furious. What the hell is going on here, Captain Henderson demanded, his voice filled with authority. His sharp gaze fell on Malik, who stood with his hands cuffed behind his back, looking terrified and confused. Henderson's eyes narrowed as he recognized the boy. This wasn't just any kid. This was Malik, his boss's son, the son of the police commissioner. Donovan's heart sank. He had no idea who Malik was when he made the arrest, but now standing in front of the captain, the weight of his mistake hit him like a truck. Sir, I... Donovan began, his voice faltering as he struggled to explain. But Captain Henderson wasn't interested in excuses. His face was set with anger as he turned to Malik. Malik, are you okay? Henderson asked, his tone softening as he spoke to the boy. Malik nodded slowly, still shaken by the whole ordeal. Henderson's jaw tightened as he looked back at Donovan. You better have a damn good explanation for this, officer. But Donovan was at a loss for words. He had just made the worst mistake of his career. As Captain Henderson stood towering over Officer Donovan, the reality of the situation began to sink in fully for Donovan. The commanding officer's eyes were filled with disappointment and anger, and his intimidating presence left Donovan scrambling for a way to explain himself. But there was no easy explanation. He had handcuffed an innocent 12-year-old boy, the son of the police commissioner, all because of his own prejudices and assumptions. Sir, I... I thought he fit the description of a suspect we were looking for, Donovan stammered, trying to salvage what was left of the situation. His voice was shaky, and the confidence he had earlier displayed was nowhere to be found. He could feel Captain Henderson's eyes burning into him, waiting for an explanation that made sense. But deep down, Donovan knew there wasn't one. Fit the description? Henderson echoed, his voice laced with disbelief. You're telling me that this boy, this 12-year-old kid, fit the description of a criminal? What exactly was your reasoning here, officer? Donovan opened his mouth to respond, but the words wouldn't come. The truth was, there was no reasoning, just his own biases. Henderson's words cut deep, and Donovan felt a wave of panic wash over him. His career, his reputation, everything was on the line, and he had no way to justify what he had done. Malik stood silently beside Captain Henderson, his heart still racing, but now there was a flicker of hope. He wasn't alone anymore. The presence of Captain Henderson, someone in authority who cared about what had happened to him, brought a small sense of relief, but the fear of what had just happened lingered in his chest, a reminder that he had been treated like a criminal for no reason. Henderson shook his head, disgusted by Donovan's actions. Take the cuffs off him, he ordered, his voice cold and firm. Now! As Officer Donovan fumbled to explain himself, an onlooker from the park who had witnessed the arrest, Kevin arrived at the police station. He had followed Donovan's patrol car after feeling uneasy about what had transpired. Kevin, a local parent who often brought his kids to the same park, knew that Malik had done nothing wrong. After witnessing the officer's aggressive behavior, he felt compelled to step in. Kevin approached the station with his phone still in hand, ready to share the video he had recorded of the arrest. Inside, as Captain Henderson continued to press Donovan for answers, Kevin entered and caught the attention of a desk officer. I need to speak to someone in charge, Kevin said, his voice urgent. I have footage of what happened at the park. That boy didn't do anything. The officer just cuffed him for no reason. The desk officer glanced at Kevin's phone and then quickly called for Henderson. Within moments, Kevin was ushered into the room where Donovan stood awkwardly, and Malik was still trembling beside Captain Henderson. When Henderson saw Kevin's phone and heard the man's explanation, his eyes narrowed even further. He already knew Donovan had crossed a line, but this new evidence only confirmed it. Show me the footage, Henderson said sternly. Kevin nodded, playing the video on his phone. The room fell silent as the video showed Donovan confronting Malik at the park pulling him off the swing and handcuffing him without any real cause. 
Malik's voice could be heard pleading, explaining that he hadn't done anything wrong, but Donovan had ignored him entirely. The atmosphere in the room grew heavier with every passing second. Donovan's face drained of color as he watched the video, realizing that his actions had been recorded and that there was no hiding from what he had done. Captain Henderson's expression grew even darker as the video ended. This, Henderson said, his voice low and controlled, is unacceptable. Even after seeing the video footage and hearing Captain Henderson's stern rebuke, Officer Donovan still clung to the belief that he had acted correctly. In his mind, he had simply done his job keeping the neighborhood safe. But the more Donovan tried to justify himself, the more it became clear to everyone in the room that he was refusing to face the truth. His stubbornness and refusal to acknowledge his biases were becoming his downfall. I was just following protocol, sir, Donovan stammered, glancing nervously at Henderson. I didn't know who the kid was, but he fit the description we were given earlier. I was just trying to make sure there wasn't any trouble. Henderson's face hardened. Protocol, he repeated, his voice growing more incredulous. This is what you call protocol? Handcuffing a 12-year-old boy with no evidence of wrongdoing in front of a park full of people? Ignoring his explanations? Ignoring the fact that you were dealing with a child? Donovan swallowed hard, realizing he was losing whatever shred of defense he thought he had. But instead of backing down, he doubled down on his excuses, his voice growing more desperate. Sir? I didn't have time to sort it all out in the field. It's a tense situation out there, and I was just trying to maintain control. Henderson's patience had run out. Control, he echoed, stepping closer to Donovan. This isn't about control. This is about your inability to see past your own prejudices. You didn't bother to listen to the boy because you saw what you wanted to see. A suspect, not a kid. As Henderson spoke, Kevin watched silently his phone still in hand. He knew the officer's excuses were flimsy at best, but it was clear that Donovan's actions had been rooted in something deeper than just a simple misunderstanding. It was bias, pure and simple, and now the entire room could see it. Henderson gave Donovan one final look of disappointment before turning to Maliak. Let's get these cuffs off, he said quietly. This never should have happened. The moment the handcuffs were removed from Malik's wrists, the boy felt an overwhelming wave of relief. His wrists throbbed from the tightness of the cuffs, but the worst pain was the emotional toll of being treated like a criminal. Malik's heart was still pounding, and though his hands were free, the fear and confusion remained. Captain Henderson placed a comforting hand on his shoulder, silently reassuring him that he was safe now. I'm so sorry this happened, Malik, Henderson said softly. You didn't deserve any of this. Malik nodded, unable to find his voice just yet. The shock of the whole situation still held him in its grip, but Henderson's calm presence helped ground him. The captain led Malik outside, away from the station's harsh fluorescent lights and into the fresh air. As they walked, Malik could see Kevin watching from a distance, the man who had recorded everything. For a brief moment, their eyes met, and Malik felt a small spark of gratitude. Meanwhile, Donovan remained inside, his head spinning with the weight of what had just happened. He had never anticipated this kind of fallout when he first approached Malik in the park. But now, with Kevin's footage as undeniable evidence, he knew that his career and his life was on the verge of unraveling. Back outside, Henderson guided Malik toward a bench near the station's entrance, allowing the boy to sit and catch his breath. Malik's chest still felt tight from the anxiety, but he was beginning to feel a sense of safety return. The tension that had filled the air minutes earlier had started to dissipate, though Malik knew he wouldn't forget this experience anytime soon. As he sat there, Henderson took out his phone and dialed a number. I need to call your parents, he said gently to Malik. They need to know what's happened. Malik nodded again, his voice finally returning in a small, quiet whisper. Thank you. Back inside the station, Officer Donovan sat at a desk, his heart pounding in his chest. Panic had fully set in now. He had lost control of the situation, and there was no way to fix it. His mind raced as he thought about the consequences, his career, his reputation, everything he had built over the years. It was all slipping away. He had ignored the warnings, the dispatcher's updates, and now even his commanding officer had seen the truth of his actions. The walls of the station felt like they were closing in on him. 
Donovan had always prided himself on his authority, on being the kind of officer who kept order in the community. But now all of that was in jeopardy. The truth was undeniable, and the video Kevin had captured would make sure there was no hiding from it. The evidence was clear. Donovan had overstepped, and there was no going back. Across the room, a few officers exchanged glances, whispering quietly among themselves. Donovan could feel their eyes on him, could sense their judgment. He had been one of them for years, but now in the span of just ten minutes, he had become the center of a controversy that would likely end his career. Captain Henderson returned to the station, having called Malik's parents and explained the situation. His expression was calm, but underneath it was a simmering anger. Donovan knew that when Henderson was done dealing with him, the real consequences would begin. The department would launch an internal investigation, and Donovan's actions would be laid bare for everyone to see. Donovan's stomach churned as he sat there, waiting for the inevitable. He had made a terrible mistake, and there was no way to undo it. The panic gnawed at him, and all he could think about was how everything he had worked for was about to be taken away in an instant. As Captain Henderson re-entered the station, Donovan saw the fury in his eyes, but what he didn't know yet was just how deep the consequences of his actions would go. Henderson walked up to Donovan and stood over him, the silence between them heavy with tension. Donovan shifted uncomfortably in his seat, his pulse racing as he awaited what would come next. Henderson spoke slowly, each word measured but sharp. You didn't just arrest any boy today, Officer Donovan, he said, his voice low and controlled. That child is Malik Thompson. Does that name sound familiar to you? Donovan blinked, confusion crossing his face. No, sir, he replied cautiously, trying to understand where Henderson was going with this. That's because you didn't bother to find out who he was, Henderson continued, his tone growing colder. Malik is the son of Commissioner Thompson, your boss. You arrested the police commissioner's 12-year-old son without cause, humiliated him, and treated him like a criminal. All because you couldn't see past your own assumptions. Donovan's face went white. He felt the blood drain from his face as Henderson's words hit him like a sledgehammer. The commissioner's son? He had handcuffed and arrested the commissioner's son? The weight of his actions became even heavier now, crushing him under the realization of just how far-reaching his mistake would be. His mouth went dry, and for a moment, Donovan couldn't find his voice. I... I didn't know, he stammered weakly. I didn't know he was the commissioner's son. That's the problem, officer, Henderson said, his voice hard as steel. You didn't know because you didn't take the time to ask. You saw a young black boy in a park and immediately assumed the worst. Now you're going to have to answer for it. The full weight of Captain Henderson's words hung in the air. And for a moment, Officer Donovan felt as though the ground had fallen out from beneath him. Arresting the police commissioner's son wasn't just a mistake, it was a career-ending disaster. The implications were immense, and Donovan could feel his heart pounding in his chest as the magnitude of what he had done finally set in. Donovan's mind raced. He had prided himself on his years of service, believing that he was keeping the community safe. But in a single reckless moment, all of that had been undone. His assumptions, his prejudices, had clouded his judgment and now there was no escaping the consequences. He had thought Malik was just another kid to be dealt with, someone who fit the description. Now he was faced with the fact that this boy was not only innocent, but the son of the most powerful figure in the department. The color drained from Donovan's face as he struggled to speak. Sir, I... I didn't know, he repeated, his voice barely above a whisper. I had no idea who he was. Henderson's eyes narrowed. That's the point, Donovan. You didn't know because you didn't bother to find out. You didn't give that boy a chance. And now you've made the biggest mistake of your career. Donovan wanted to argue, to explain himself, but he knew there was nothing he could say that would make this right. The damage had already been done. His hands trembled as he realized that the story was already out of his control. There was no fixing this. The commissioner would find out, the public would find out, and Donovan's career would be over. As the silence in the room stretched on, Donovan felt his chest tighten with panic. He had spent years climbing the ranks, believing that he was untouchable. But now, in a matter of minutes, he had destroyed everything he had worked for. While Donovan sat frozen in shock,
Captain Henderson stepped away and made a call to Commissioner Thompson. It was a call Henderson dreaded, knowing the storm it would unleash. He explained the situation carefully, detailing how Malik had been wrongly arrested and how Donovan had acted without cause. There was a long silence on the other end of the line as Commissioner Thompson absorbed the news. When Thompson finally spoke, his voice was calm but icy. Bring Malik home. Now, he said, his tone leaving no room for negotiation. And I want Donovan dealt with immediately. Okay. Henderson assured the commissioner that Malik would be escorted home safely and that the officer's actions would be thoroughly investigated. After hanging up, Henderson returned to Malik, who was sitting quietly on a bench outside the station. Malik's fear had lessened somewhat, but the ordeal had left him shaken. The 12-year-old boy, who had done nothing wrong, had been thrown into a situation that could have had far worse consequences had it not been for Captain Henderson's intervention. We're going to take you home now, Malik, Henderson said gently, kneeling down to the boy's eye level. Your dad's waiting for you. Malik nodded, still feeling a mixture of relief and exhaustion. He was ready to put this nightmare behind him, but he couldn't shake the feeling of how close he had come to something far worse. For a moment, he glanced back toward the station, where Officer Donovan was still inside, sitting alone at the desk, his world crumbling around him. Henderson motioned for one of the other officers to drive Malik home. Take care of him, Henderson instructed, watching as Malik climbed into the patrol car, and make sure he's treated with the respect he deserves. As Malik was driven home, the reality of Officer Donovan's situation began to unfold. Donovan, still sitting in the station, was left to contemplate the inevitable consequences of his actions. He knew that there was no escaping the fallout. He had arrested the commissioner's son, humiliated a child, and allowed his own biases to guide his actions. Now he would have to face the repercussions. The weight of what had happened pressed down on Donovan's shoulders, and he began to see the chain of events for what they were. Karma coming back to hit him hard. His entire career had been built on the belief that he was enforcing the law fairly. But deep down, Donovan had known there were times when his judgment had been clouded by his prejudices. This incident had simply brought those prejudices into the light for all to see. Word of what had happened quickly spread through the station. Officers whispered among themselves, some in disbelief, others shaking their heads knowingly. Donovan had always been tough, always quick to assert his authority. But this time, he had gone too far. The karma he now faced wasn't just about this single incident. It was about years of unchecked behavior finally catching up with him. Back at the station, Captain Henderson received a call from Internal Affairs. The department had already launched an investigation into Donovan's actions, and it was clear that the officer's career was on the line. Henderson felt no sympathy for Donovan. He knew that this incident had only scratched the surface of a deeper issue. By the time the sun set that evening, Donovan's world had crumbled. His badge and gun were taken from him, pending the investigation. He was told to leave the station and await further disciplinary action. As he walked out of the building, the gravity of what he had done settled in. He had been arrogant, reckless, and now karma had delivered its blow. While Donovan faced his fate, Commissioner Thompson was at home, waiting for his son to return. The anger that simmered beneath his calm exterior was a force to be reckoned with. Malik was his pride and joy, and the thought of his son being treated like a criminal made his blood boil. Thompson had spent his entire career working within the system, fighting for fairness and equality, but now the very system he had worked to uphold had failed his own child. When the patrol car pulled up to his home, Commissioner Thompson rushed out to meet his son. Malik stepped out of the car, looking tired and shaken, but unharmed. Thompson immediately wrapped his arms around his son, holding him tightly. Malik buried his face in his father's chest the fear and tension of the day finally melting away in the safety of his father's embrace. Thompson knelt down to meet his son's eyes, his voice soft and filled with concern. Are you okay, Malik? He asked, brushing a hand over the boy's shoulder. Malik nodded slowly, but Thompson could see the emotional toll the experience had taken. His son's innocence had been stolen in a single moment of prejudice, and that was something Thompson would never forgive. After thanking the officer who had brought Malik home, Thompson took his son inside, where his wife, Nadia, waited anxiously. She rushed to Malik, pulling him into her arms as tears filled her eyes. 
Oh, baby, I'm so sorry, she whispered, holding him tightly. As they sat together in the living room, Thompson's anger simmered just beneath the surface. He knew that Officer Donovan would face consequences, but for Thompson, this wasn't just about one officer. It was about ensuring that this kind of injustice wouldn't happen again to anyone. While Malik was safely at home with his family, Officer Donovan faced an entirely different reality. After being stripped of his badge and gun, Donovan was called in for questioning by internal affairs. He sat in a small, stark interrogation room, his hands clasped tightly in front of him as two investigators prepared to go over every detail of what had happened that day. Donovan felt the pressure building inside him as the investigators began their questioning. Walk us through what happened at the park, one of the investigators said, his voice firm but neutral. Why did you decide to approach the boy? Donovan took a deep breath, trying to steady himself. He knew that his actions had been reckless, but he still clung to the idea that he had been following his instincts. There was a report earlier in the day, Donovan began, his voice faltering, a report about a suspect causing trouble in the area. And the boy, Malik, he fit the description. The investigators exchanged a glance, unimpressed with Donovan's explanation. What exactly was it about him that made you think he was the suspect? One of them asked pointedly. Donovan hesitated, the weight of the question settling over him. He knew there was no good answer, no justification that would hold up under scrutiny. He was wearing a red hoodie, sitting alone. I just thought he looked suspicious, Donovan finally admitted, his voice barely above a whisper. The lead investigator sighed and leaned back in his chair. Officer Donovan, do you realize that you arrested an innocent 12-year-old boy based on nothing more than your own assumptions? He asked. And that those assumptions were rooted in bias? Donovan's chest tightened. The truth was inescapable now. No matter how hard he tried to explain his actions, he couldn't escape the fact that he had let his prejudices guide him. And now, he would have to face the consequences. While Officer Donovan struggled to justify his actions in the interrogation room, Commissioner Thompson's fury reached its peak. The more he replayed the events in his mind, the angrier he became. His son had been treated like a criminal for no reason, and that fact enraged him beyond words. As a father and as the police commissioner, Thompson knew that what had happened wasn't just a mistake. It was a reflection of a broken system, one that allowed officers like Donovan to operate with impunity. At home, Thompson sat down with his wife and Malik, trying to comfort their son while still grappling with his own rage. His wife, Nadia, was equally devastated, and her tears only fueled Thompson's determination to seek justice. She had always worried about Malik being out alone, especially knowing how society often viewed black boys as threats, regardless of their innocence. Now her worst fears had come true. We need to make sure this never happens again, Nadia said quietly, holding Malik close. Her voice was filled with a quiet strength, though Thompson could hear the underlying pain in her words. Thompson nodded, his jaw clenched with anger. I'm going to make sure Donovan faces the full weight of the consequences, he said, his voice tight. He didn't just arrest an innocent boy. He arrested my son, and I will not let this slide. Nadia looked at her husband, her eyes filled with determination. He has to be held accountable, not just for Malik, but for every child who's been treated like this. Thompson agreed. This wasn't just about getting revenge. It was about sending a message. The system had to change, and officers like Donovan needed to understand that they couldn't hide behind their badges anymore. The time for excuses was over. What had happened to Malik was unacceptable, and Thompson was ready to do whatever it took to ensure that no other child would have to go through the same experience. Back at the station, Donovan's interrogation was not going well. His attempts to explain himself had fallen flat, and the investigators had little patience for his excuses. Every word out of Donovan's mouth only deepened the hole he had dug for himself. The truth was plain for everyone to see. He had made an arrest based on bias, with no evidence or reasonable cause, and now he was facing the consequences. After hours of questioning, the investigators concluded that Donovan had violated protocol in multiple ways. His actions had not only endangered a child, but they had also tarnished the reputation of the department. It was clear that Donovan's future with the force was in serious jeopardy. When the lead investigator finally spoke, his voice was calm but firm. 
Officer Donovan, it's clear that you acted recklessly and without proper cause. Your actions were guided by assumptions rather than facts, and as a result, an innocent child was harmed. Effective immediately, you are suspended without pay, pending further investigation. Donovan's heart sank. He had expected some kind of consequence, but hearing the words spoken aloud made the reality of the situation hit even harder. His career, his livelihood, everything was hanging by a thread. The investigator's tone left no room for negotiation. Donovan had no choice but to accept his fate. As he stood to leave the interrogation room, Donovan felt the eyes of his fellow officers on him. The weight of their judgment pressed down on him, and he realized that the respect he had once commanded within the department was gone. His colleagues had seen the video, heard the reports, and now he was no longer one of them. He was an outcast, a symbol of everything that was wrong with the system he had sworn to uphold. Outside the station, Donovan walked to his car, the silence of the night swallowing him. The consequences had hit hard, and there was no escaping the fact that his actions had changed his life forever. The fallout from Donovan's actions wasn't limited to the police station. News of Malik's wrongful arrest spread quickly throughout the community, and soon it was making headlines across the city. Local news outlets picked up the story and the details of the incident, an innocent 12-year-old boy being handcuffed and humiliated by a police officer sparked outrage. Television stations ran footage of the arrest, recorded by Kevin at the park. The video showed Donovan's rough treatment of Malik and the boy's visible fear and confusion. The media coverage fueled public anger, and social media erupted with posts demanding accountability. Hashtags like Nairi Justice for Malik and Hanar Nairi and racial profiling began trending as people from all walks of life voiced their support for Malik and his family. The community, already wary of the police due to previous incidents of racial profiling, was furious. Protests were quickly organized, with residents marching through the streets, holding signs that read, Justice for Malik, and Protect Our Children. The tension between the police and the public, already fragile, had reached a boiling point. People demanded change, and they wanted to see officers like Donovan held accountable for their actions. At the center of it all, Commissioner Thompson remained composed but resolute. He understood the community's anger. He felt it himself. But he knew that real change wouldn't come from outrage alone. It had to be systemic. Thompson began working behind the scenes, pushing for reforms within the department, ensuring that incidents like Malik's arrest wouldn't happen again. At home, Malik watched the news coverage with his parents, still processing everything that had happened. The support from the community was overwhelming, but Malik couldn't shake the memory of being handcuffed and treated like a criminal. His innocence had been stolen in a matter of minutes, and it was a feeling he would never forget. The police department was thrown into chaos as the story of Malik's wrongful arrest continued to spread. Public trust in the police had already been fragile, and this incident had shattered what little remained. Calls flooded the department from angry residents, demanding answers, accountability, and reform. Officers who had once worked quietly behind the scenes were now caught in the center of a media storm, forced to confront the reality of the department's flaws. The department's leadership, including Commissioner Thompson, knew that they had to act quickly to prevent further damage. Public relations teams were brought in to manage the fallout, and a formal statement was prepared, acknowledging the incident and promising a thorough investigation. But for many in the community, words were no longer enough. They wanted action. Commissioner Thompson, torn between his role as the department's leader and his role as a father, made it clear that this wasn't going to be swept under the rug. He worked closely with internal affairs to ensure that Donovan's actions were properly investigated and that reforms would be implemented to prevent future incidents. Thompson's focus was on restoring the community's trust, but he knew it would take time. Behind closed doors, department officials scrambled to implement new policies. Training programs were reviewed, and new guidelines for handling interactions with minors were put in place. The department began working on outreach programs aimed at rebuilding trust with the community, especially in neighborhoods where tensions were highest. Despite these efforts, the damage had been done. The department's reputation was tarnished, and for many in the community, the reforms seemed like too little, too late. The public wanted to see real change, and they wanted to see officers like Donovan held accountable. 
The pressure continued to mount, and the department knew that they were facing a long and difficult road ahead. As the investigation into Officer Donovan's actions continued, it became clear that his future with the department was uncertain. The evidence against him was overwhelming, and the public outcry had only made matters worse. Donovan had already been suspended without pay, but now he faced the very real possibility of losing his job altogether. Internal Affairs had compiled a detailed report outlining Donovan's history with the department. While this was the most egregious incident, it wasn't the first time Donovan's judgment had been called into question. He had received several complaints in the past about his aggressive behavior, especially when dealing with young black men. Those complaints had been quietly dismissed, but now, in the wake of Malik's arrest, they were being brought back into the spotlight. The department's leadership knew that keeping Donovan on the force would be a public relations nightmare. The community was demanding accountability, and anything short of termination would only fuel the growing mistrust between the police and the public. Commissioner Thompson, still reeling from the personal nature of the incident, made it clear that there would be no leniency in this case. Donovan, for his part, was beginning to realize just how dire his situation was. His career, once a source of pride, was now in freefall. He had spent years building his reputation as a tough but fair officer, but now all of that was crumbling before his eyes. The public viewed him as a symbol of everything wrong with the police force, an officer who had abused his power, driven by bias and prejudice. As Donovan awaited the final decision from internal affairs, he couldn't escape the feeling that his career was over. The respect he had once commanded was gone, and now he was left to face the consequences of his actions. Dunyam, shall I continue with the final chapters of the story? Let me know how you're feeling about the progression. Você disse, continue. O chat GPT disse, let's continue with the next part of the story. That's right, Dunyam. Ichin. 26. A public apology is demanded. As the investigation into Officer Donovan's actions progressed, public outrage continued to build. The community was no longer content with internal disciplinary actions being taken behind closed doors. They wanted accountability, but they also wanted transparency. More importantly, they wanted an apology, one that came from the department itself, acknowledging the systemic issues that had allowed this incident to happen in the first place. Community leaders began organizing meetings and speaking out at city council gatherings, demanding that the police department publicly address Malik's wrongful arrest. People wanted to see genuine remorse, not just from the department, but from Donovan himself. The call for a public apology gained momentum, and it wasn't long before city officials and media outlets began to echo the community's demands. For Commissioner Thompson, the situation was personal. On the one hand, he was responsible for upholding the integrity of the department, but on the other, he was Malik's father, and he had seen firsthand how the system had failed his own child. He knew that the department needed to take responsibility, not just for Donovan's actions, but for the culture that had allowed those actions to occur. After days of intense pressure from the public, Commissioner Thompson made the difficult decision to hold a press conference. He knew that this would be a pivotal moment for the department, and it was his opportunity to address the community's concerns head on. Standing in front of a crowd of reporters, cameras flashing, Thompson spoke with a mixture of authority and personal pain. What happened to my son should never have happened to any child, he began, his voice steady but filled with emotion. This department has a responsibility to protect and serve, and we failed in that responsibility. I want to offer my deepest apologies to Malik, to my family, and to the community. We are committed to making sure that this never happens again. His words were powerful, and though they didn't erase the harm that had been done, they marked the beginning of a long journey toward rebuilding trust. Twenty-seven, facing the consequences, Officer Donovan's fate was sealed in the days following Commissioner Thompson's public apology. The investigation had concluded, and the findings were clear. Donovan had violated multiple departmental policies, and his actions were driven by bias. Internal Affairs recommended his immediate dismissal, and the department's leadership agreed. Donovan's career as a police officer was officially over. Donovan sat alone in his apartment, staring at the termination letter in front of him, his badge and gun, 
once symbols of authority and pride, had been stripped from him. The weight of his actions, combined with the public backlash, had left him isolated and disgraced. His colleagues, once friendly and supportive, had distanced themselves, unwilling to be associated with the scandal. As he read through the letter for the third time, Donovan couldn't escape the reality that his own choices had led him to this point. He had allowed his prejudices to guide his decisions, and now the consequences were impossible to ignore. He had lost everything, his job, his reputation, and the respect of the community. Outside, the protest continued. The community wasn't just fighting for justice for Malik. They were pushing for broader reforms, determined to hold officers accountable for their actions. Donovan had become the face of everything the community was fighting against, a symbol of the systemic issues that needed to be addressed. Though Donovan tried to convince himself that he had just been doing his job, deep down, he knew the truth. His actions hadn't been about protecting the community. They had been about power, control, and his own biases. And now he was paying the price for those choices. As he packed up his belongings from the station, Donovan realized that he had no future in law enforcement. His career was over, and there was no going back. Twenty-eight, a lesson in humility. For Donovan, the fallout from Malik's arrest became a harsh lesson in humility. Once seen as a tough, no-nonsense officer, he now found himself jobless and disgraced, shunned by his colleagues and ostracized by the community. The media coverage of the incident had painted him as the villain, and there was no escaping the public scrutiny that followed him wherever he went. As the days turned into weeks, Donovan struggled to come to terms with his new reality. His name was tarnished, and every job interview he attended ended the same way. Employers didn't want the baggage that came with hiring someone who had been at the center of such a high-profile scandal. His confidence, once unshakable, was now shattered. In the quiet moments of reflection, Donovan began to see his actions in a different light. The arrogance and entitlement that had once fueled him now felt like a distant memory, replaced by the harsh reality of his downfall. He thought about Malik, about how his own biases had led him to treat a child as a suspect without a second thought. The more Donovan reflected, the more he realized that he had been part of a system that allowed such behavior to go unchecked. Donovan's downfall wasn't just about losing his job, it was about losing a sense of self. He had built his identity around his role as an officer, believing that his authority gave him the right to judge and control others. But now, stripped of that authority, Donovan had no choice but to confront the person he had become. The lesson was clear. Power without accountability leads to destruction. And Donovan had learned that lesson the hard way. 29. The boy's strength shines through. While Donovan's life unraveled, Malik's journey was one of healing and strength. The experience had shaken him to his core. But with the support of his family and community, Malik began to find his way forward. His parents, particularly his father, had been his biggest advocates, ensuring that the system that had failed him would be held accountable. Despite the trauma of being wrongfully arrested, Malik refused to let the experience define him. He returned to school, surrounded by friends who supported him, and he began to speak openly about what had happened. His teachers and classmates rallied around him, and Malik found strength in sharing his story, knowing that it could help prevent the same thing from happening to someone else. One day, his school organized a special assembly where Malik was invited to speak about his experience. Standing in front of his peers, Malik spoke with quiet confidence, his voice steady but filled with emotion. I was scared, he admitted, but I learned that I'm stronger than I thought, and I want to make sure that no one else has to go through what I did. The audience listened intently, moved by Malik's bravery. His words carried weight, not just because of the ordeal he had endured, but because of the strength he had shown in overcoming it. Malik's courage became a beacon of hope for others, a reminder that even in the face of injustice, there is always a way to rise above it. As he stepped off the stage, Malik was greeted with applause, his classmates and teachers cheering for him. It was a moment of triumph, not just for Malik, but for everyone who had supported him. The boy who had once been treated like a criminal had emerged as a symbol of resilience and hope. 30. A New Day, A Change Community 
In the weeks and months following Malik's wrongful arrest, the community underwent significant changes. The outrage that had erupted in the wake of the incident had sparked a movement for reform, and residents were no longer willing to tolerate the status quo. They demanded better from their police force, and the pressure they applied led to real, tangible change. Commissioner Thompson spearheaded a series of reforms within the department, ensuring that officers received better training on implicit bias in community relations. Policies were put in place to prevent incidents like Malik's from happening again, and a new culture of accountability began to take root within the force. Officers were held to higher standards, and those who couldn't meet those standards were removed. The community also became more united in its efforts to create a safer, more just environment for everyone. Local leaders organized town hall meetings where residents could voice their concerns and work with law enforcement to build trust. Malik's story became a rallying cry for those who had long felt marginalized, and it gave the community a renewed sense of purpose. For Malik and his family, life slowly returned to normal. The fear and trauma of the arrest lingered, but they found comfort in knowing that their fight for justice had made a difference. Malik continued to thrive, excelling in school and building new friendships. He had become a symbol of resilience in the community, and his strength inspired others to speak out and demand change. As the sun set on another peaceful day in the neighborhood, it was clear that something had shifted. The community was no longer divided by fear and mistrust. There was a sense of unity, of hope for a better future. And at the center of it all was Malik, a boy who had faced injustice and emerged stronger than ever.